Hey guys, welcome back to the farm. Uh, today is July 11th, so we're coming in into some midsummer stuff. So with that, we are working with some midsummer cover crops, which are really fun. You can sequester a lot of carbon really quickly. Uh, as most plants, they require a specific number of degree growing days, right? So the, the temperature's above a specific threshold temperature and sun and water. And then, and, and so when you hit that threshold, you can get really, really, really quick growth. So this here, this is a, uh, um, a sorghum mixture. So this would be sorghum and buckwheat. And so what we did, we I, uh, I planted this into what was prior our spinach bed. And that spinach bed, like most of our beds, gets weedy because kind of neglectful about certain things. Um, so we get a lot of grasses and weeds in. Cool thing is though, is you can break those cycles within a season in small scale patches like this within a bed by just simply coming through. So I, what I did, I came through, I mow killed it, I broad forked it, which is a lot of work. You should check out some videos. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it if you have compact soils and you wanna, uh, and you wanna get a mid-season planting done. Came through, broad forked it, and did a sorghum buckwheat mix. So that's gonna lay down a crazy amount of carbon. I can come back and I can kill this off right now, or I could wait right until the buckwheat goes to flower. Buckwheat can become kind of invasive if you let it go to seed. I don't suggest letting it go to seed unless you're gonna harvest it for flour. But, um, so what we'll do, we'll come through, we'll mow kill this, and we'll come in and plant some really good fall crops. And so what this can do is, is uh, incorporate a whole bunch of phosphorus, a decent amount of nitrogen, not, not great, there are no legumes in here, but there'll be a decent amount. Um, and, uh, and a whole bunch of carbon, being able to continue to retain more and more moisture while also feeding all of our microbes, like what we discussed. Now, uh, you can see you can see up in over here, this looks like a real hot mess. It is a real hot mess. Um, the grass has kind of gotten out of control. Grass is my nemesis around here, but what we got going on, this was peas, and so trellised peas. Then we came through and we planted, uh, we transplanted a bunch of cucumber vines. Those cucumber vines are, have a whole bunch of fruit on them now. And then in between there, I did, um, I did summer squash. I did a whole row of summer squash and peppers, all planted in together. They're all doing, they're all thriving. They're doing fantastic. There's a bunch of fruit on everything. Um, we didn't even amend this soil. So I literally haven't even brought in any nutrients. All it is is companion planting um, and, and just focusing on good soil health. And so once again, just really underpinning, underpinning the importance of focusing first and foremost on your soil. So we have a whole bunch of squash bugs in there, whole bunches of them, squash bugs, uh, cucumber beetles, what have you. I neglect the daylights out of, I haven't watered any of this plot, uh, goodness, in at least a month. And I can go through and harvest just a plethora of fruit. Um, so just once again, kind of underpinning that importance. So some of the fun of cover cropping. Uh, we try really hard not to worry about some of the invasive weed species and some of the grass species, because what I'm gonna do is this plot is gonna get actually killed off before a lot of this gets finished going to seed. Also, if it does go to seed, I wouldn't really worry about it. Uh, a lot of people spend a whole lot of time and energy that's unnecessary worrying about the little details like that. If that does all go to seed, what I can do is this fall when I come through and I finish harvesting squash and peppers and there's still say a month worth of growing left in the season, you know, a month worth of the growing season left, I can come in and just tarp this. Check out silage tarps, we've talked about them before in some of our other videos. We demonstrated some of their utility um, just in being able to kill off a seed bed, right? So if all, all this goes to seed, that'll be okay. I can kill off said seedlings. Um, I'd like to show you guys some of the, uh, some of the chaos up in here and some of the, uh, some of the insect pressure on some of the squash. And you can see that in healthy soil, if left alone and neglected, um, if left alone and neglected, you can still get really, really, really high production. Plus, if you're selecting for certain traits, you hold back seeds from your healthy individuals that were able to withstand insect pressure. Guess what, next year, those plants, they're gonna withstand insect pressure a whole lot better than the ones you bought at the store. So if you guys can come on over here and check out this, uh, this creepy, crawly, creepy crawly deal right here, brace yourselves. If that doesn't make a gardener's skin crawl, I don't know what will. 
That's a whole bunch of nymphs of squash bugs. Squash bugs are a hemipteran, meaning that they have a sucking, piercing mouth part. So what they do is the adults, they go through and they stab their mouth part into the tissue of your squash or your precious melon plant. And uh, you know, it's usually not their bite that kills the plant. It's usually a virus, a virus that uh, can then get in and weaken the plant. Um, and you see, I'm really not too freaked out about them. And I got a couple of reasons for that. Uh, number one, healthy plants. Healthy plants can withstand them. We have a lot of squash that they'll look like they're about to die from squash bugs. And guess what? You leave them alone two, three days later, they're either dead or they perk right back up and they're healthy. And then you know what? Then the squash bugs move on. So there's been a, a concept in, in uh, like grazing ecology that scientists have demonstrated over and over and over again. If you give plants long enough to be able to respond to grazing or, or, or herbivorous pressures, if you give that plant long enough to respond to it, it will respond to it. A lot of plants do. And, um, and honestly, then those, those herbivores, those herbivorous plant uh, insects, they will move on to a new plant. We find that to be true in with our squash. We also plant enough squash um, and we plant them pretty dense because we know that this is gonna happen. So instead of worrying about it, uh, I recognize that, you know, I may get a little smaller yields than some, so instead I plant a little higher uh, number of plants. And then I don't worry about it. And you know what? The predators, the predators will come back in. There's a, uh, there's a concept in ecology called predator swamping or prey swamping. And basically it's, it's uh, as prey population increases super high, there's going to be a time lag in when the, your predaceous insects are going to come in and their population then will boom in response to the booming prey population. And then they will begin to control said prey population at about that time then oftentimes because of the density the overall uh, population density of the prey, then what ends up happening is disease then starts to wipe, go through, etc. And so you have a boom bust cycle. I'm just waiting for the bust. It's going to happen and you know what? My plants will survive it and we'll still keep getting lots of good fruit. That's some good looking stuff right there. Check out all these uh, cucumber vines. Nice, young, beautiful pickling cucumbers all over on them. Super healthy. Um, just and we have these planted along these trellises about every three feet. So pretty good spacing, you know, three foot by three foot area for them. Um, peppers, cucumbers, grass. So once again, as I like to tell people, grass likes to compete with grass. Grass competes with other things, but grass really likes to compete with grasses. So if you're planting corn, kill your grass. If you're planting peppers, I don't even worry about it. I plant. Uh, well, for example, in my corn, we plant beans, we plant squash, sometimes I even plant some peppers. So we're going to walk this way and check out our Hugel Mound. So as we were talking and, and headed over this way, uh, here is one of our big Hugel mounds or Hugel culture. So Hugel in German or Latin or what have you, I think it's German, means wood and culture means to grow, right? So we're growing with wood. And so the, the principle of this, the idea of this is we are gonna take a whole bunch of dead down decaying lumber or, or in this case logs. Um, don't use treated lumber. Uh, a lot of people say don't use walnut or cedar. They can can uh, release different, I'm sorry, excuse me, different toxins that can negatively impact your plant's growth. Those are called allelopathic, allelopathic effects. Um, anyway, so what we did, so I took a whole bunch of elm and some oak and things like that, and I mixed both softwood and hardwood into a giant pile, and then I brought in a mountain, basically a mountain of uh, hog bedding from the winter. So it already composted nicely, um, and but it was just, straw, some manure, some urine, and some, some soil. And I brought that and I just dumped it on top of it. And what, and then of course soil over that. Um, and a good hugel can be super productive, uh, reducing your need for water, um, as well as of course providing a long lasting nutrient. So what happens is all those nitrogen, all that nitrogen, all that phosphorus, calcium, everything gets absorbed into the logs. So every time that it rains, all those nutrients are going to get absorbed into your spongy, softer wood first, right? So your elm, your cottonwood, things like that. That's why they do say it's important to use a soft wood uh, or mulch or something to that effect to actually absorb that first huge impact of nitrogen.
And then what that'll do is as that wood breaks down and decays, that'll slowly feed your microbes, which will then continue to slowly feed your plants. So what this is doing, this is just a simple, simple way of having a really long-term fertilizer. Some people use Hugels uh, in super highly productive systems for 15 years before they really need to redo them. So they are, they're a little bit labor intensive to start, but they're definitely worth it. Uh, go rent yourself a skid loader for a little bit, get a big pile of logs and some manure and some soil and you're off and running. So what we did in this one, so we have a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of native pollinator habitat right around it that we leave. We have thistles which aren't native. This variety of thistle isn't native, uh, and a bunch of cat mint. We utilize this as medicine, so we appreciate it. So we don't weed it, right? We don't really like to weed. Um, weeds provide habitat for our pollinator friends, and we like pollinator friends. We have. Uh, so in this mound, we did uh, two different varieties of cantaloupe. We are not saving seeds from this mound. If we saved these, they would be hybrids. Um, may not necessarily be a bad thing, but in some cases it is. We did Crenshaw melon and a Hale's Best jumbo cantaloupe. Um, at a different location on the farm, we have where we save our seeds. So once again, if you want to save seed, don't plant like things next to like. Don't plant winter squash next to winter squash of different varieties. Um, a little more specifics about it. You can check out one of our other videos for that though. Uh, but so there's been no pesticides, no herbicides, no weed control on this. Just literally using my main crop more or less as a cover crop in order to be able to suppress the weeds. And, uh, and of course, as our cash crop, we also do have cilantro and some sweet peppers growing in this. Um, there's, there's not enough good that I can say about hugels and about growing food in general in Hugels. We don't have to water this. We're in basically a desert and it doesn't need to be watered. And there's just a fantastic amount, absolute fantastic amount of melon in here. Um, just right here where I can see without moving leaves, I'm seeing four, five, six, seven, eight, eight almost ready melon and probably 40 little melons that are getting ready. So, uh, it's worth checking out and it's worth trying at home. Uh, you can't really do it wrong. You can't ruin it. You can't uh, just avoid, again, avoid treated wood and avoid walnut. And otherwise you'll be good to go. So on up over this way, uh, on up over this way, we're gonna check out some really cool updates on our Hopi blue dent corn after you guys take a look here at the melon. So again in here, now that you guys can see. So here's some younger Crenshaw melons, not quite ripe. They're close though. When the melon will pull easily from the vine, when it begins to dry up, uh, you're, you're ripe, you're ready to go. Um, and then over here we have, here are just traditional cantaloupe. Oh, I, I don't know if we can get to it up in there. It's kind of up and over there. Or here's some younger ones, not quite as ripe. But there's several right there that are lovely. If you guys really ever want to be just, uh, have a really easy way to grow a lot of food, put in the work for a Hugel mount. Um, it is no joke, the hands down easiest way to have really healthy plants and really healthy plants are able to withstand insect pressure. Um, I've never been really successful at growing cantaloupe here at the farm. Uh, just our soil type isn't quite what we need to have and whatnot, uh, other than on hugels. So I'm a huge proponent of them. They work better than anything. I really love hugels. They are fun. So over here is our Hopi corn. Uh, it's a blue dent corn, so it would be one of your, your ancient varieties uh, or your unimproved varieties. Uh, a lot of people like to argue about genetically modified organisms, right? I'm gonna go there, yep, I sure am. Uh, 
A lot of people do like to argue about genetically modified organisms. Um, and while I see some of the utility of some of the GMOs, a lot of people who argue about GMOs say, ah, humans have been genetically modifying things since there's been humans in, uh, being involved in agriculture. And I say, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. However, though, this is being genetically modified slowly over generational time while being in a functional ecosystem rather than being in a laboratory and having a gene from something else inserted into something else, making a chimera and an abomination of God and nature. Not a fan. Um, so yes, humans have been genetically modifying corn for thousands of years. Corn is from Mesoamerica, so it'd be from uh, Central America, maybe Northern South America and Mexico. And it was a staple crop and a little bit in the lower 48, which used to be Mexico, you know, up in the Four Corners region. Um, a staple crop and it was widely traded throughout North America. Again, even the Cherokee of the Southeast grew it just because it was a, a, a traded commodity. Um, but so this corn, it's an ancient one. It comes from the Hopi reservation. It has higher protein content than your normal field corn. Uh, when it's young, it can also be used as sweet corn. So it's really sweet. Uh, but again, much, much, much higher protein content. This stuff is awesome. I highly recommend that you find a, a good, reputable seed supply. Um, it is a bit expensive to get into growing it. You know, you're gonna spend $4 on a packet of seed uh, or on a quarter pound, you're gonna spend 20 bucks. So it is a bit expensive, but I, I personally believe it's worth it. Um, it's great animal fodder and it makes really good chips. So, and look, it's super healthy, super happy. We haven't fed it, haven't had to do anything. And in there, if you guys can see, there's a bunch of uh, bush beans were growing in there. Uh, and I don't remember what else, but so this is some of our corn. We have, we have a total of this year, just shy of about an acre of blue dent corn growing around the farm. Um, we do it for our, our, our food stuff and for livestock, of course. So we're gonna go uh, check out the last of the cantaloupe in this patch and, uh, and we'll head this way. Hey guys, so over here we have one of our fun teachable moments. Um, everybody I talk to complains about them, has horror stories about them, stripping all of their, stripping all of their leaves off their trees and, and all their fruit off of whatever they're growing. We don't have a problem with them and I can demonstrate that, um, unequivocally demonstrate that, but we do have them and we have a lot of them. So here's our red clover flower. There's a Japanese beetle, okay. Now this next plant right over here, garden nightshade. There's its uh, berries. So this might be one of the edible garden nightshade varieties that produces a purple berry that you can use. Um, I'm not gonna try it because there's also some that you just really don't want to mess with. And but uh, but look at this plant, right? Every single leaf has been stripped. Every single leaf. This is an invasive or mildly invasive plant in gardens that people scurn or scourge. They pull it up, they hate it, they say it takes over, and it causes them so much headache. Well, look, not a leaf on it. You know what that was from? Uh, my hypothesis was um, Japanese beetles. We have a lot of them around the farm. However, though, you know what they haven't been hitting? My cucumbers, my melons, my squash, um, my peppers, they haven't been hitting. You know what they do hit? All sorts of nasty, nasty weeds that no one likes. So it's kind of a win-win. Um, if, we, if we stop trying to control things in a natural system, but instead we promote a natural system and we insert what we need into that natural system, I guarantee it'll work better. Guarantee ya. If it doesn't, I will literally pay for your seed for your garden, literally. I'll pay you back for your seed for your garden if it doesn't work. Um, if you do it in like literally a hands-off way. So there's a, there's a fellow who grows uh, chestnuts up in Wisconsin. I don't remember his name. Uh, really good farm though, do some research on it. His whole idea was called stun, sheer total utter neglect. That's what he did and he did it with trees. And at first he was having huge losses, 50, 75% of his saplings were dying. You know what though, then the 25% that survived to, to fruit production, to nut production, were really healthy. And so 
if we can do that and we can unbreak our brains, unbreak our brains, our thoughts, the way that we think in this society is broken. The way that we think in most societies is broken. It's just being human. So if we can change that, we can insert our, we can insert our needs, our plants, right, into a system. And we, I guarantee you, you'll have better results. So we don't water this, it's dry. Here's cucumbers. These are just little pickling cucumbers, you know. But they're all over in here. Look at all these weeds, who cares? Look at all that. Then they're all over along here. There's a bunch more cucumbers. Just insert, and look, there is no, no insect pressure on these cucumbers. These leaves aren't wilted. It's hot, it's dry. We've had over 100 degree temps, which, which cucumbers like, but they also like a lot of water. And, oh, here, here, perfect. Perfect, ready to go pickling cucumber. Just perfect. There's no cucumber beetles, no cucumber beetles, no borers. And the reason is, again, we have a functional ecosystem here. Look at all of the, uh, the insect pressure here on this dock plant. The bugs are gonna come to your garden if your garden is the only green stuff around. Versus if you put your garden into a bunch of green stuff, guess what, there's gonna be predators. It's gonna be a functional ecosystem. I can't harp on that enough. Here's icicle radishes, icicle radishes, the flowers bring in a type of fly called a tachnid fly and that tachnid fly comes up and it goes and literally hunts for squash bugs and it lays its eggs on the squash bugs, I think. Don't quote me on that, I don't remember. I know it's a dipterin fly. Um, but that's what I've read and what I've heard is that they fly up and they lay their eggs on them and, uh, and then of course then their eggs consume them. Um, so what I'm saying here is fix the way that we think and we can change the world for the better and if nothing else you can grow a whole lot more food for a whole lot less work which means that you can be happier you can be healthier your communities can be happier and healthier look at look at these just wild cucumbers this is about as I mean I'm looking for fruit it's pretty early for them these were late transplants but um, so anyways the way that people have always done things is not always the right way to do things. That whole saying, well, I don't know, this is the way we've always done it. Don't make it right. So uh, once again, thanks for going on a, on a walk through our chaotic garden with us. Uh, always enjoying some of, the, some of the fruit of our labor. Um, or almost lack thereof sometimes with our, our sheer total utter neglect methods. Sheer total utter neglect. Stun it, right? So just literally stun method. Uh, I don't know who first coined that. If he sues me for copyright infringement, I guess that I'll take it. Um, but uh, it's a pretty cool system and it does work. Uh, if you just figure out what types of plants you can insert into what types of systems. So we actually, we've even planted uh, planted things down in the forest before, it works great. Uh, planted things that uh, are shade tolerant and like cooler temperatures. We've been able to have brassicas, so like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts do really well down in a forest with literally no attention because um, you're gonna have less weed competition just due to the fact there's less sunlight uh, and what have you. So less weed competition, which is great for broccoli right and cooler temperatures which is also great for broccoli so it really like I'm trying to say is it really depends what type of plant are you wanting to grow figure out a system that it can grow in don't bother trying to change the system put what grows in the system into the system so that's enough of my rant for the day thanks for checking out our videos once again uh, we really appreciate it check us out on Facebook YouTube uh, and the like all those um, and uh, hope you guys enjoyed the videos. Thanks for your support.